So good morning and welcome everyone. I hope you are all doing well um, in the midst of class registration and um, the semester kind of coming to an end, which is weird. Uh, my name is Isaiah Franco and I'm a sophomore majoring in Spanish and International Affairs with a minor in Environmental Studies. I'm also a student coordinator in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion or ODI. Thank you for attending today's event, Uplifting Zapotec, Indigeneity and Language Revitalization in a Transnational Context. We will begin with a formal land and labor acknowledgement, recognizing not only the lands that Walford College occupies, but also the lands of the Lenape people which Haverford occupies. As an office, ODI has a social responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which Walford currently exists. We acknowledge that we gather as an institution of higher learning on the traditional land of the Cherokee, Salagoweti peoples past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout generations, which also includes Africans who labored, enslaved Africans who labored to lay the physical foundation of the college. As a result, ODI as an office commit to actively engage in learning how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit and continue to honor the history of the indigenous and enslaved peoples who suffered in the creation of the college and who are credited for its existence. Um, Brooke, I'm not sure if you have your acknowledgement ready. Would you like to read it now or later? Sure, I'll read it now. And thank you for that, Isaiah. Um, yeah. Felipe and I are speaking to you today from Haverford College, which we recognize that we live and work on Lenape land. We want to pay respect and honor to the caretakers of this land from time immemorial until now and into the future. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so um, moving forward, um, this educational discussion was planned and executed through the leadership of ODI, Dean Taifa, myself, and members of the Indigenous Peoples Heritage Month Planning Committee. Today's event, however, is only possible thanks to the incredible work that the Teacher Project has done to centralize and revitalize Zapotec in a digital context. Today's event will feature a brief icebreaker related to language and connections. Then we will learn more about indigeneity and the Zapotec language through a math lesson followed by poetry reading. Then individuals who indicated that they would like to participate in breakout rooms beyond the hour long educational presentation will be able to join in smaller discussion groups. Prior to attending this session, you all received, received information on how you can engage with the Zapotec language on your own. Our desire to host this educational discussion stems from the need to inform and educate the Wofford College student body on the contemporary usage of indigenous language. Through this lens, we hope to define the concept of indigeneity and gain a better understanding of the moder modernity of indigenous peoples and their cultures. It is our hope that with increased knowledge of the language revitalization efforts of indigenous communities and their allies, each of you in the audience this morning will be able to use your positions of privilege and power uh, to uplift, amplify, and hear the voices of these marginalized communities. Thank you for attending, and we are so thankful and excited to hear from our speakers, Dr. Felipe Lopez and Dr. Brooke Lillehagen, re representing the Teacher Project. Felipe H. Lopez is a postdoctoral scholar in community engaged digital scholarship at the Haverford College Libraries. He is originally from the Zapotec town of San Lucas, Giovanni, Oaxaca. At the age of 16, he migrated to Los Angeles, California, speaking no English and little Spanish. By 2007, he had earned his PhD from UCLA, focusing on Mexican indigenous issues on both sides of the border. His Zapotec poetry can be found in Latin American Literary Review, the Acentos Review, and Latin American Literature Today. Dr. Brooke Daniel Lillehagen is an associate, an associate Professor of Linguistics at Haverford College. She received her PhD in Linguistics from UCLA in 2006 and has been working with speakers of, the Val with speakers of Valley Zapotec since 1999. Her work has been supported by the NSF, NEH, and the ACLS. She was awarded the 2018 Ernest A. Lyon Faculty Award for the Scholarship of Engagement for Early Career Faculty. Please join me in giving Dr. Brooke Lillehagen and Dr. Felipe Lopez a warm uh, Wofford welcome. Thank you, Isaiah. Um, and thank you so much for all the, we've already had so many wonderful conversations. I feel like even though we're not together, um, I really appreciate um, our time together. And I wanna thank Isaiah and Taifa for, for all the work they've done leading up to this and for, for welcoming us. Um, as, I, as Isaiah mentioned, 
we wanted to start with just a little icebreaker. And I'm going to pop a question into the chat. Um, what is one language in your life? And who does that language connect you to? And maybe you'll be inspired to talk about even more than one language, but let's all think about what is what's one language in your life and who does that language connect you to? If you want to take a couple of minutes and then if you feel comfortable, we'd love to see some some of what comes up in the in the chat here. So take a minute and feel free to pop in your answer there. I'm reading all of these as they come up and I, I hope that you're doing the same. I see a lot of smiles. Um, I see a lot of expressions of connections to different types of communities, to, to chosen communities, to communities of practice, to communities of culture, to family, to individual people. Isaiah, is there something that you're noticing here or something you'd like to, to bring forward with this? Um, yeah, I think just like the diversity of language that's being mentioned is kind of amazing to me, um, especially when I feel like I only hear English and even also mentioning English as well is also key to like connecting with your family too. So yeah, just like the diversity of language is amazing. We're a multilingual group here today. Um, thank you all for being willing to share that and I feel already that the people are reflecting on not only what languages are in your life and what language can be, but also what we can use language for and what language can do. And uh, that's some of what we're gonna be talking about today. I think Felipe didn't put anything in the list, but we're gonna hear from him directly <laughs> in just a little bit about, about that. Um, I think what we should do now, and I'm gonna share my screen if that makes sense. Um, we have three things we want to bring to you today. We want to open up with a little bit of context about indigeneity, about Zaptec um, language and life and context. Um, then I'm going to put you to work and we're going to do some Zaptec math. <laughs> so I hope you have a paper and pencil handy. Um, and at any point, if there's questions, um, you can put them in the chat either directly or you can put them in the chat to Isaiah, who's going to help us moderate those questions. Okay, um, we're gonna take some pauses along the way. We don't want this just to be us <laughs> speaking straight uh, at you. So please please keep those questions coming as, as they occur to you. Um, and then finally, we're gonna end with some Zeptek poetry. And then as Isaiah said, an opportunity for, for further discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen. Okay, does this look right? I think you're seeing uh, my PowerPoint now. Yes. Thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Um, Isaiah shared this before, but as we get started, um, we wanted to share this again. We're going to invite you to join us in some intentional educational communities um, in social media, including on Twitter, um, either now or in the future. If later you want to continue this conversation, these are some ways that you can continue this conversation both with us and with other members of the teacher team and of the larger uh, community of practice that exists here. So 
take a screenshot if you uh, want to note these. Okay. Um, and to get us started with our first question, I'm going to pass this off to, to Dr. Felipe Lopez. We can't hear you. Sorry, I always do that. I talk to myself. <laughs> Så kan sila så att det är sånt där det är det nu när jag det till när jag är en dis typ som dis den chile kapen sinir ni är några bundista och bunda chur chiselo till ni är ni är en bundista. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being with us today, and I hope that this was this will be a fruitful uh, conversation with you guys, and then. Uh, we're going to start by uh, thinking about what is indigeneity, and then I'll also tell you what it means to be Zapotec for me. So if you guys for a minute would reflect on what you think of when you think of Native people or Indigenous people in Mesoamerica, in one context, have you interacted with Native people? Or what or who determines who is an indigenous person? And so, and also before today, have you ever learned about native issue directly from uh, a native educator? So if you can just take a couple of minutes and think about those questions, and then again you might pop them into the chat, and then we'll see what uh, what sort of um, things we can see, and then I will uh, talk to talk about myself, what it means to be Zapotex within the Mexican and also in the US context. So let's um, let's let's see what what you guys can uh, can write about this. So I'll give you a few a couple of minutes and then uh, please reflect on these questions. Maybe, yeah. Uh... Right, um, maybe you can, uh, uh, okay, as I'm reading these uh, comments and also now I'll talk a little bit about what it means to be Zapotec for me. Um, as hopefully you all know or, uh, that in Mexico, I, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, I'm from Oaxaca uh, and I'm from a very small community uh, that uh, speak, uh, about 98% of the population speaks Zapotec and I grew up growing up thinking about me as Mexican and I actually never thought about thinking about me being Zapotec. I always thought of being Mexican. Uh, and uh, it was not until I came to the US that I realized that uh, these layers of uh, identities that I embody, uh, given that when there's a process in Mexico, which we are all thought to be a cosmic race, right? This uh, fusion between Europeans and uh, I guess indigenous people with the invasion of uh, Spain to Mexico. 
you know, there was this mixture of, of these two races, if you want to call that. But in, in real life, you know, I have had a lot of discriminations toward me from my own compatriots. So that really um, made me think, what is it that I am? If, if I'm Mexican or why this sort of tension between the mestizo population and the indigenous community? And I start reflecting what what that really means for me as an as indigenous person, specifically as a Zapotec person. And thinking about that, I think what makes me a Zapotec, it's this, uh, first of all, that the fact that I speak an indigenous language, right? Because the moment that somebody hears me speaking an indigenous language, uh, they tend to see me no longer as a Mexican, but as, but as an indigenous person. So it is this uh, social construction of who is or who is an indigenous based on their perception, first of all. And also uh, this idea of, uh, for me being part of indigenous community that really claims me to be part of them. And what that, what I mean is that there are processes or um, ways in which they can claim and I can claim back my Zapotecness. And that's through one of the, the mechanisms is the cargo system, which is, um, it's a community service that you give uh, to the community freely, but that which can mean that you have to become, uh, I don't know, the mayor of the community without getting paid, or, you know, you have to give the community, um, you have to be in charge of the church, all is free. So that's sort of this reciprocity that you give the community, which is the cargo system. It's a very complex cargo system, but I just, that, that what I, my point at that, I'm trying to make is this uh, reclaiming and claim, claiming you. And also part of that is that we have to contribute to the community in terms of the expenses that, you know, we might have to construct a new road. So we have to put, uh, contribute economically as well as the labor, which is the take your system, which I gave my take your system. So all these mechanisms that goes both ways. So that's when I think about me being Zapotec and in relation to my community. However, um, uh, not, you know, there is not only one way of being indigenous or Zapotecs. Uh, there are other criteria that other people can use to reclaim or identify as indigenous communities, especially in the diaspora communities where we have uh, uh, people who are born in the States uh, or grew up in the States who don't speak the language yet, they pretty much identify as a Zapotec. So it's not only one way of claiming what I talked before, it's just for me personally, but I know that uh, there are uh, thousands and, um, uh, or a lot of people who don't speak the language and yet they identify being Zapotec or indigenous in the diaspora community. So now I, um, we're going to have Dr. Lilhagen to talk a little bit about the uh, backgrounds of the languages. Great. Thank you, Felipe. Um, as we get into what is going to be the, the math portion, I want to give you a little more context about um, place and culture that we're talking about. I imagine for many of you, this is the first time that you might have heard about the Zapotec culture. Often when people think about Mesoamerica, they might they might have heard of Maya people or other, other groups. So Zapotec people and Zapotec language are primarily spoken in what is now Oaxaca, Mexico, which you can see in the bottom of this map here, um, but are also spoken by large diaspora communities elsewhere in Mexico and also in the US, including what we already alluded to as Oaxaca, California. Um, you can, I think, still go to mass in Zapotec in Santa Monica. Is that right, Felipe? Yeah, he's nodding. So. Um, to be very clear, Zapotec people exist today. Well, you've already met Felipe, but this is actually one way that indigenous people are repeatedly discriminated against by having them frozen in the past and actually having their very existence denied. The Zapotec language uh, is actually a, a language family. Um, so we've said Zapotec language, which 
is a shorthand in a way for a particular Zeptic language. The Zeptic language family is as large and complex and as old as romance. So if you think about the romance language family, think about all the different romance languages you know, right? French, Italian, Spanish, okay. Um, so Zeptic is a language family of that size and time depth. And if you look at the map here, you can see that indigenous Oaxaca is very linguistically and ethnically diverse. So that Zeptic language family you see represented there is just one of the many language families spoken in Oaxaca. And in fact, indigenous Oaxaca is more linguistically diverse than all of Western Europe. There's probably 400 to 450,000 speakers of all Zeptic languages total and all the communities are shifting to Spanish in more and more context. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why that's happening. Um, and so Zeptic languages are are threatened, may be considered endangered. Um, in some towns, there may not be children learning to speak Zeptic anymore. Most Zeptic speakers don't write their language. And to be very clear, you do not need to write a language for a language to be a real language. Those are actually very separate things, but we'll talk about some of the discriminatory ideologies around that. And this always comes up when we talk, and I so I want to be clear from the outset that discrimination against speakers of Zeptic is not just a historical event, that this happens continued today, uh, both in Oaxaca and in the diaspora. So I want to talk about some of the false ideologies that devalue Zeptic language and culture and people. And because most of our work that we're going to shift to are ways that Zeptic people are resisting these in a variety of, of contexts. So some of what is listed here is, is not only true for Zeptic people, but for other indigenous communities. And maybe you can be thinking about connections that where you see these ideologies, these systems of beliefs uh, play out in other contexts. So some of these false beliefs are that Zeptic people and language are only of the past, that Zeptic people and language are unchanging, that Zeptic language has no use outside of the pueblo, outside of the community, that it maybe isn't even a real language, that it's maybe something less than a language, that it can't be written. There's my little linguist star there that languages do not need to be written to be languages, but nonetheless, we'll see that this is a false belief. Um, and there's also a belief that Zeptic language is being used less and less because it doesn't serve a purpose in this modern world. So somehow this kind of um, explanation of the, of the loss of Zapotec is something natural. Um, but Zapotec people have been resisting these false ideologies for centuries and continue to resist them today. And so just to be very clear about all of these, these things, Zapotec people and language exist now and language and culture change just like all human language and culture changes. Zeptic language can be used publicly and globally. And part of the work that Zeptic language activists like Felipe do on Twitter are ways of directly confronting these false ideologies. So using Zeptic language in Twitter is a direct resistance to this false belief. Zeptic languages are real languages with complex grammar that en encode important knowledge. And we're gonna get to see some of that today in just a minute. Um, Zeptic languages have in fact been written for over 2000 years. And the biggest threat to Zeptic languages are these harmful ideologies in the way that they are practiced and, and embodied by people through their words and actions. Um, so Felipe and I are here today as members of the TICHA team. So here's the website. Um, and I encourage you to take a, take a look at it uh, when you have some time. There's lots of resources available there. And just to be clear, that we are just part of a, of a much larger team that consists of other Zapotec people, as well as other non-native people like myself and many, many students. So I'm really happy here to be talking um, to students and uh, how many people speak Zapotec was just in the chat. For, of all Zapotec languages, 400 to 450,000. Uh, Felipe, are there 1200 speakers of your particular language? Is that right? Uh, no, there are about 2,500 in LA and we have 1,700 in back home. Okay. All right. Um, so I especially want to uh, teach, a, in addition to being uh, focused on being a public educational resource, um, also as a pedagogical project in its, in its practice. And so students afterwards, if this is if any of this work is interesting you, to you, please uh, feel free to reach out to us and, and uh, we want to encourage you in your, in, 
in your own studies um, and thinking about ways to be involved in projects like this. Um, in addition, so Zeptec has been written for over 2000 years and when alphabetic technology was brought to Oaxaca, Zeptec people quickly adapted it for their own purposes. And there's a large corpus of alphabetic texts written in Zapotec during the Mexican colonial period. Some of these were created under the auspices of the Catholic church. So these texts here you see, uh, this is a dictionary from 1578. This is a grammar from 1578. Actually the oldest Zapotec grammar is older than the first grammar ever published about English. And it has, and Zeptic has one of the largest corpora, corpora of alphabetic texts of languages in the Americas. Um, the texts written under the auspices of the Catholic Church are credited to individuals who are not Zapotec, but we know there must have been many, many Zapotec people involved in the creation whose labor is not recognized um, with the authorship and editorship as such. And then you see on the right here a handwritten manuscript. So Zapotec people used alphabetic technology and alphabetic writing for their own purposes on a local level to write things like wills and testaments. And you can imagine all of the, um, all of the, Zaptic history, all of the knowledge about language that are available in these texts, and Zaptic people are using these to reclaim language, to recover language, and to resist in a variety of ways. And one way that that is happening is through pedagogical materials that are being created. And um, later on, I'll pop the link to this in the chat, but Felipe and I are really excited to share with you today um, some work from one chapter of this open educational resources that is available. It is a, a series of pedagogical materials on the Colonial Valley Zapotec from this corpus I just showed you, but also from modern Zapotec language and knowledge. You can see that there's a large editorship here that includes many Zapotec people and each of these chapters was actually work, workshopped with Zapotec communities both in Oaxaca and LA. Uh, so it was really created in deep conversation and collaboration with, with Zaptec people um, on both sides of the border. And so today we're gonna be looking at some numbers, but I think this might be a good place to pause before we get into some math. Um, Isaiah, what questions have come up so far? I have not gotten any, I was curious, um, a couple of slides ago, um, there was an image of a town and I was just wondering where that was taken. I don't know if that. <laughs> was it Felipe's town was, it was when he was talking? Mm -hmm. It must have been, this wow. is Felipe's town. Yes. That is my town. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah. well then maybe you guys are ready to do some math, right? So um, as we're doing this, remember that you can be popping questions into the chat, either to the Isaiah or to, to the whole chat, and we will try to get to them when we can. So this is a page from the grammar um, written in 1578, credited to Fray Fra, Juan de Cordova. Um, and you can see, look at it here a little bit, just look how it's formatted. Um, there's a question on how to reach how to reach out to us. Um, I'll put my Twitter here for now and at the end we can talk about other ways that we can get in touch. Um, so you see these like little paragraph marks on the left hand side, they're kind of like bullet points. Then you might see kind of looking down the list something that looks like Spanish but maybe doesn't look like a Spanish exactly like you know today. So we're looking at early modern Spanish here. Then there might be some words that you don't recognize that are actually in a combination of Zapotec and Latin there. And on the right-hand edge, you see the Arabic numerals, the numbers written there. Is everyone orienting themselves to what this looks like, right? So um, there's actually pages and pages of Zapotec numbers in this text. Zapotec number systems is one of the types of knowledge that's threatened during language shift. And many speakers today use Spanish numbers after 10 or after 15. Um, and so we're gonna look at some of the knowledge that's encoded in in this number system. All right. We actually had another question pop up. Please. Um, so how do Zapotec people connect within cities as large as LA? How do they connect between Oaxaca and LA? Or I guess, um, how does that community form in general? Um, yeah. Oh, this is, Felipe is an expert on this. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll mute myself. 
Okay. <laughs> well, um, how would I go about it? Because the, uh, in my, I mean, not just my community, but also in many, many communities, I think that one way which uh, once there is an establishment of immigrants in, for, for example, in LA, is that we begin to create a community uh, to uh, start cultural events that are very related to uh, the church uh, in terms of the patron saint uh, festivities. So it is around the same patron saint festivities that the whole community gathers and it, uh, you know, organizes and then uh, starts to help each other to, um, to have these festivities. And that's what like the first step, right? And then the ones that began, it takes place every year. And then uh, through networks, we let other, other members know that what's taking place. So in a sense, that, that, that's one of the mechanism by which many, many Zapotec communities begin to form as you know, a satellite committee in LA and other um, states, uh, whether it's in, in the US or in other cities in, in the diaspora community. So we, we have this mechanism of community engagement and community networks that uh, we use. I don't know if that makes sense, but. <laughs> it definitely does, thank you. All right, so let's see, back to Zapotec math. All right, so I'm gonna zoom in on, uh, I went ahead and transcribed um, the first four numbers there. And we're given two numbers each for the numbers one, two, three, and four. These, these were the numbers four, 500 years ago. Um, and so one thing I wanna do first of all is let's listen to Felipe say these numbers um, today. So this is, these, this, this grammar was written very close to where Felipe lives. Um, and so in terms of geographic area and in terms of language it's probably a very closely related language but 500 years have passed. And if you've read English or Spanish 500 years ago, you know that language changes. So let's listen and think about what are some of the changes that we hear. So Felipe, would you be willing to say the numbers one through four in your language? Sure, that's Tehib, Diop, John, Tap. Thank you. So those sounded most like what we see in set A here. Right, but certainly not identical. And one thing you may have noticed is that there was only one syllable in what Felipe was saying. And there seems to be two syllables in the words that are written here. There's been a major sound change in the last 500 years in which unstressed vowels were lost. And so all of these final vowels are not there. So now that you know that, I want you to listen one more time to the words one through four and see how you can connect what Felipe is saying to the set A numbers. Would you be willing to say them again, Felipe? Sure. Dave. Diop. John Dapp. Okay, do you see that? So it, they're still not identical, but maybe you're starting to make connections. You may notice that there's a lot going on in the vowels that don't seem to fit here. Zapotec, in fact, is a tone language and it also makes phonation contrasts. That's a little more detail than we were planning on getting in today, but if you're hearing things and you're saying, wow, that seems like that's a lot more than is being represented there, then you're right. And you've got your linguist ears on that you're listening to all those distinctions that are happening there. Um, Felipe, looking at these numbers here, do you have any numbers that look like any of the numbers that are in set B? Yeah, the only thing we have nowadays is the first one, number one, which, which we uh, use today, which is cha. Cha. So can you tell us about when you would use the first, the set A number one, and when you would use the set B number one? Well, the set number A, we use it at any time counting anything. However, for set B, we use that only to count tortillas or bread. Those are the only thing, two things that <laughs> we use it nowadays. Other than that, we don't have any other use for it. So, you know, Felipe is telling us that this number one is being used only to count tortillas and bread. And that might be surprising to you. might be thinking, why is there a special number for that? In fact, this is something that's called a noun class system and lots of languages have noun class systems. 
um, where based on certain properties, there's different numbers or uh, different determiners even. So actually gender, so-called gender languages are an example of noun class where there's a different word for the, a different form of the word for the, depending on grammatical features. And it seems that 500 years ago, flat things, including tortillas and other flat things were counted with a separate set of numbers. And that's really been reduced today where we don't see any of the other set B words except for the word for one, and in Felipe's language, it's only used to count tortillas. In some other Valley Zapotec languages, we see it used to count a few other flat things, but it seems to really be reduced. Um, so already looking at the historical corpus, um, there's information about the number system that is being recovered there. Um, I'm easing you into doing some of your own analysis. What you're seeing here on the screen is called morphological analysis. This is something that linguists do where we break up the parts of the words into all the pieces that mean something those are called morphemes, but you can just think that of them as meaningful parts of words. So if you look at the word for 11 here, we have three pieces, three morphemes, chi, bitobi, and the first one means 10, the second part means and, only, in, only when relating to numbers, and the last part means one, and so we have 10 and one, and that means 11, and hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Uh, Felipe, how would you say 11 in your, in your language today? So tape. One more time, please. So tape. Okay, so you can see that there are sound differences, but I hope you can he actually hear those parts in there. Okay. And we're given in this historical text, we're given two words to say 12. The first one looks almost identical in structure to the what we just saw for 11, right? It's just the last word for one is substituted the word for two. Okay. And then we have another form that we're given where we're given the set B form for, for two. We have no examples in this text. We can only imagine that this might have been used to count flat things. Um, Felipe, how would you say 12 today? Subtiop. And that Sub one looks like this, right? Would you say it again, Felipe? Subtiop. Mm -hmm. And do you have anything that looks like the other word for 12? No. Nope. All right. When we get to 15, um, things get a little more exciting and we actually have a phrasal expression of 15. So first looking at the, the shorter for 15, it looks like it might start with the word for 10, which might not be surprising. So all number systems in all the world's languages, numbers are built off of other number building blocks. Okay, there's no language in the world where there's some sort of unique word for all the numbers. Okay, they're compositional in nature. And if you think about English 15, you've got the fifth, which is related to five, you've got the teen that's related to 10, right? But here we see the, maybe looks like 10, but then we don't see anything that looks like five. And so maybe this is just a number that means 15. But the next part, the next phrase actually is quite complex. I've broken it down here and it looks like it says another five will walk to 20 or another five will arrive at 20. So I want you to think a minute and think about what concepts are being employed to express 15 here? How is 15 being calculated? And I don't know if someone feels brave enough to, to say something out loud or if people wanna put things in the chat. What's different about how 15 is being expressed here than like what we saw with 10 and one, 10 and two, I'm trying to look at the chat. Um, I can you hear me? Yeah, Alex, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, it seems to be on the one hand, it seems to be subtractive, so it's working back from twenty. Um, so it's saying like, you know, in five, you know, in five you'll get to twenty. Um, and the other part of it is, it seems to be like. Uh, I don't know if, what the word would be, I guess, analogous or, um, uh, no, what's the word? Um, metaphorical. So it's, it's, you know, it's got a sort of performative aspect almost to it That's with this idea of walking and arriving. Yeah. Wow. Yes. So Alex keyed in on, on very important concepts here. So first of all, notice that this 20 is this landmark. And instead of having kind of this 10 and two, 10 and three, exactly as Alex said, there's the subtractive, like if you went five more then you would get to 20, right? So we're relating ourselves in relationship to 20 and we're not quite there yet. And then Alex also pointed out this metaphor, this metaphor of motion. 
right? This metaphor of movement along something like a timeline, okay? Um, and this is gonna come into play as we look at a little bit more of the numbers. And I'm looking at the time, I wanna make sure that we have enough time to listen to poetry. So if this part feels a little rushed, I wanna encourage you, I did drop in the, uh, the chat, even more Zaptec math for you, okay? So right now I want you to, to look at these numbers that I just circled here, 40, 60, 80, 100, 200, 300, okay? And remember what I said that number systems in all world's languages are compositional in nature. So we expect higher numbers to have parts that we've seen before. They're not all unique, right? So take a minute and see what parts that you've already seen before in the smaller numbers can you recognize in 40, 60, 80, 100, 200, 300. Okay. I'm just gonna give you a minute and I'm gonna ask you to put these in the chat. You're looking for pieces that you recognize from the lower numbers that you're seeing in these numbers that I've circled here. And maybe let's start with 80, because maybe that one is very obvious. What does 80 look like? Pop it in the chat, or if someone feels moved to speak out loud, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, Isaiah says it looks like the word four, the set B word for four, absolutely. And so then, then Isaiah is already getting to the next step. So like if there's a four and it means 80, then there's kind of an implied 20 in there, right? There's a double A in 80, in eight and 80. Yeah, so Zapotec has vowel length. Um, we can't always take the writing so seriously that was written in this time since it was conflated with Spanish writing and all sorts of stuff. But yes, that probably means it was a long vowel. Felipe, do you, do you know this word today? Would you say the word 80 today? Sure. Da. Da. So you might think why people wrote two A's there. What about the word for a hundred? What, do you recognize any pieces in a hundred? It has the same, um, almost exact same root as three, except it adds a, an A at the end. Ah, I see that it looks like three, but it also looks like another number. And this is because tone isn't being represented in, in how it's being written in the colonial time period. Do you see another number that it looks like? Yeah, and just put it in the five, yeah. Yeah, see how it looks like five? So 80 looked like four, and 100 looks like five. And Isaiah already said, well, if we've got four, we want a 20. We don't see expressions of 20 overtly in these. But notice if we go back to 40, it start, sort of starts like the number two starts. And 60, kayo, looks like the set B word for three, three times 20. Now we've got four, four times 20, five times 20. If you look at 200, looks like it starts with 10, right? And then if you look at 300, it looks like it starts with 15. So you've got a base 20 system here. You've got a base 20 or a vigesimal counting system. Right? Now in English, 100 is like a new word. Remember I said number systems are compositional. But then there are moments in the counting system where you get new words, where you get unique words, where the counting starts over, right? And in English, a decimal system, 100 is very important, right? It's a new word. And then you don't actually get a new word until what in English? You reuse words, you reuse morphemes until you get to what number? So you get to a thousand, right? But here, a hundred is not so special. A hundred is just five twenties, five sets, five twenties. But if you look at 400, that's a special number, right? If you look at 400, there's no pieces that are being reused. It's a new number. It's the start of a new count. And why would that be? Can someone connect the dots? It's 20 times 20. There you go, Alex, right, yeah. So 
there's so, there's so much more we could do through this and and please please check out our, our pedagogical chapter on that if you're more interested in this um but i want to make sure we have time to then experience Zapotec and poetry as well so i'll leave you with these questions and maybe this is something that we could pick up in the breakout rooms or later on um thinking about what kind of knowledge is encoded in the Zapotec number systems and you might even do some research later on what types of architecture were built what type of astronomical calculations were made using in this base 20 number system. And I'm wondering just what this brings up for you about questions about Zapotec or just languages in general. So hold on to those questions. And uh, for now, I'm going to pass this on to Felipe. Um, hi there again. So <laughs> well, becoming a Zapotec writer, I think it goes hand in hand with, uh, for me, at least in terms of if you remember, I talked earlier about my awareness of becoming indigenous or Zapotec in relation to the um, to the mestizo population in Mexico on both sides of the border, right? So, as I arrived in LA, I it was you know I never thought about well I felt the the, the discrimination, racism, but you know I just always felt like well that's part of life and. Who cares, right? But um, when I really began college and sort of opened these doors of questions, right? Like, what does that mean? You know, why why am I being treated differently? You know, and also I didn't have all the information in terms of like being around younger generation Zapotec, younger generation in Zapotec communities, and then they're not talking Zapotec, they're, you know, answering Spanish or English. So that was the moment in which kind of it clicked in me that my language, it was getting on a verge of extinction, if you will, at least in LA, because as more and more kids were born in, in LA and not speaking the language, the, the language was being lost. So that's that at that moment that I sought out some of the, uh, some help from the linguists at UCLA to help me preserve and write my language because as we talked earlier that uh, we didn't have, or most people who speak the language, they don't know how to read it or write it. So we really need to come with a system in which uh, we need to record the language. So in a sense, that was the very moment that uh, I became a language activist. And then later on, you know, I continued to work with uh, with Pam and Rowan Brooke and to write some uh, pedagogical um, uh, four volume teaching do documents and then I started teaching Zapotec and then I, and then for me I think that this idea of really writing it down right more like in terms of poetry and short uh, stories was in, when I started participating in the Twitter project, which I worked with younger generation back in Oaxaca. So that really motivated me to write uh, my language. And I started just, you know, writing small things in Twitter, which eventually became part of this uh, series of poetry that um, I uh, published. So, in, in in a minute, I'll be reading you some of this uh, poetry translation. And it, as I do that, I encourage you to just listen to the words, listen to the tone and the rhythm, and see what what you get out of it. So, uh, you know, as as we mentioned, it's a tonal language. So please uh, just pay attention to some of the stuff, some of the tone, because um, it's really, I, I know it's really hard to hear, but I think it would be worthwhile. So as I start reading Grandmother, um, uh, I hope that you can appreciate this tonal language. So here we go. Mom, why, why do Ucaldia? Good day, la chicha. Zikya, Shinigo Kaldegekya, Shinezak Diosliu, na Plat Laza. The money cage or Jig Mul, Tatiri Mul, Zietri Anilovesh, 
زنیاریک رو آریک تو گوین نه دی سهرگویا بر ناشتی کوادریگریک خشین روانا کوان رسا لشتیت بون بونی نوا یک مول نای Mother, Shnana, Naigam Nalo, Yet Skaria, Najivikia, Kariu, Zeu, Ladinua, Shini Zeu, Shini Iza, Rabandua Shaliu, Shinir Wielo, Rabania Junu, Rabeza Shinis Stave. Mitla or gish anim. We alua ji. Nani natarik. Nataji. Rniana. Re kete yana. La jagikya. Winze. Winziet. Al ruan rak. Azang rindiaga. Rkasa inivia. Kedar jil di si luar. Seni kedni agak. Logai hisni anak. Kuar serunya kuja. Ruyer luar stave. Niaw gab si luar. Karier asawa. Nu tu gak kriye. Et karier los na. Shigawa. Karier mungkin luar. Tutte i dna gheo, su i zegna che c'è anima. So, I guess in conclusion, you know, about the, this experience of you reading, listening to the poetry, what do you take out of it, you know? How, what, did you notice any sounds? Uh, what question came in the within the context in some of them that's pretty much a Mesoamerica context. Uh, so those are some things that I would like you to think about. Uh, did the poetry make you curious about anything? Uh, could you connect to the themes in poetry? So if you just think about it and then um, probably can put it in chat and I hope you, uh, you enjoy that, thanks. Thank you, Felipe. We have a few minutes, I guess, for questions now, Isaiah, before the breakout rooms. I don't know how. There's some comments about the vowels. There's some comments about intonation. I'll put the final questions in the chat too, in case people want to respond to those. Isaiah, are there questions that have come up to you? No, I haven't gotten any questions, um, but something that I took away that um, I just keep thinking about is uh, just how I remember in the last line of grandmother, the English translation had so many words to sort of describe my heart or my head, and it was just a two word line in the Zapotec and I don't know something about that. I don't know. Yeah, just like the amount of meaning conveyed in just that. <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned about my heart. Um, I mean, uh, feelings in Zapotec, the word with feelings has hearts in it. So it's, you know, that's this idea of a poetry and translation that sometimes we really need to find what best to translate that. Because um, if I had translated that literally like Arnalaza uh, in one of the poems, it uh, literally means my heart hurts for you but uh, we just say miss you. So we lose all these little um, subtleties and emotions in the translation. So sometimes, yes, we, you know, in Zapotec you might see it shorter and then in English you see it, you know, longer translations or vice versa. So that's the, the challenge in, in, in uh, poetry and translation. Um, 
so we did actually get a couple more questions while you answer that. Thank you. Um, that's so like, ah, yeah, challenging to think about. Um, could you speak a little bit about um, the way in which Zapotec youth is sort of connecting or engaging with the Teach a Project, project or it's a poetry? Um, yeah, did that make sense? <laughs> you want to talk about uh, Teach a Brook? Well, I was actually going to ask you, do you want to talk about um, the conversatorios that you ran with, with uh, that included Zapotec youth how, and how they're responding to this? Yes, I think that uh, I think um, I think that teaching has become a very powerful tool for people to reclaim their language and identity. During the summer, we had what's a conversatorio. Um, I'm not really sure how to translate that in English. Uh, that uh, several um, people were involved back in Oaxaca, and we use well as we I think as Brooke mentioned that a lot of the uh, younger generation, I said that, or I even said that, that they're losing a lot of the words. So we have no other way or, or you know, of going back in time and saying like, hey, um, how did you say this? And fortunately we have the teacher project in which we can go and then look at some of the words, for example, um, a uh, one young woman in the community, she realized that there, there was this word uh, in a way to count like 60 and 80, right? That they no longer use in their community, but given that there were six or seven communities talking at the same time and looking at the teacher, we reinforced that. So now she is using teacher project in order to go back and think, what else uh, was lost in her community, just like in mine. So it's, 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 it's a tremendous uh, resource for us Zapotec uh, communities or Zapotec speakers that we can go there and then we can our, our words, you know, uh, that has been lost in this uh, time that we've, that the Spanish has been kind of the main language in which we have used for concept, but we, are rethinking about it and then reclaiming those lost words. So I hope that um, that that helps in, in how we use teacher in language revitalization in the community. And I'll add one thing to that. Um, when we were workshopping the numbers lesson, I, I think important context that maybe I should have put in the background is that there's little to no opportunity to, for Zeptic people to learn about his, their own history and language in formal educational settings. Felipe and I have a partnership with a high school where that is, we have a little space to change that, but mostly there's no space. And so when we were workshopping the numbers section, I don't know if you remember that first page I showed you, the last number 16,000. And one of the septic youth that was in Felipe's workshop said, well, oh, it's too bad that the numbers only went up to 16,000. And when I saw that, when we saw that, I realized that, you know, the ideologies are so powerful and so pervasive such that she would think that that's where the number system stopped, right? That there were no numbers after that. And so it's necessary to say, of course, Zaptek counting could be used to count infinitely like any, like any number system. And so not only a reclaiming of words, but a reclaiming of knowledge and a reclaiming of scientific systems, right? Um, so I thought I would add that. Thank you so much for your answers. Um... And we do have a couple more questions, but I think um, in the interest of time, now is a really good time to close. Um, so anybody who does have to go, um, thank you so much for attending. Um, I really enjoyed this and I've learned a lot and I hope you all have too. Um, and so with that being said, feel free to go. We will be doing breakouts for a little bit after this, but um, enjoy the rest of all of your days. And thank you so much, Dr. Um, Lila Hogan and Dr. Lopez. Thank you everyone for taking time to, to learn with us. Thank you for being with us today.